Chapter 13 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter 13 Kirwan's Search for High Brasail. The boy Kirwan lay on one of the steep cliffs of the island of Inismain, one of the islands of Aran, formerly called Isles of the Saints. He was looking across the Atlantic for a glimpse of High Brasail. That was what they called it. It was a mysterious island which Kirwan's grandfather had seen, or thought he had seen, and Kirwan's father also. Indeed, there was not one of the old people on the island who did not think he had seen it, and the older they were, the oftener it had been seen by them, and the larger it looked. But Kirwan had never seen it, and whenever he came to the top of the highest cliff where he often went bird nesting, he climbed the great mass of granite called the Gregory and peered out into the west especially at sunset, in hopes that he would at least catch a glimpse, some happy evening, of the cliffs and meadows of High Brasail. But as yet he had never espied them. All this was more than two hundred years ago. He naturally went up to the Gregory at this hour, because it was then that he met the other boys, and caught puffins by being lowered over the cliff. The agent of the island employed the boys and paid them a sixpence for every dozen birds that he might sell the feathers. The boys had a rope three hundred feet long which could reach the bottom of the cliff. One of them tied this rope around his waist and then held it fast with both hands, the rope being held above by four or five strong boys who lowered the cragman or clifter as he was called over the precipice. Kirwan was thus lowered to the rocks near the sea, where the puffins bred, and loosening the rope he prepared to spend the night in catching them. He had a pole with a snare on the end, which he easily clapped on the heads of the heavy and stupid birds, then tied each on a string as he caught it, and so kept it to be hauled up in the morning. He took in this way twenty or thirty score of the birds, besides quantities of their large eggs, which were found in deep clefts in the rock, and these he carried with him when his friends came in the morning to haul him up. It was a good school of courage, for sometimes boys missed their footing and were dashed to pieces. At other times he fished in his father's boat or drove calves for sale on the mainland or cured salt after high tide in the caverns, or collected kelp for the farmers, but he was always looking forward to a time when he might get a glimpse of the island of High Brasail and make his way to it. One day, when all the fleet of fishing boats was out for the herring fishery, and Kirwan among them, the fog came in closer and closer, and he was shut apart from all others. His companion in the boat, or dory mate, as it would be called in New England, had gone to cut bait on board another boat, but Kirwan could manage the boat well enough alone. Long he toiled with his oars toward the west, where he fancied the rest of the fleet to be, and sometimes he spread his little sprit sail, steering with an aura thing, which was, in a heavy sea, almost as hard as rowing. At last the fog lifted and he found himself alone upon the ocean. He had lost his bearings and could not tell the points of the compass. Presently, out of a heavy bank of fog which rose against the horizon, he saw what seemed land. It gave him new strength and he worked hard to reach it, but it was long since he had eaten. His head was dizzy and he lay down on the thwart of the boat, rather heedless of what might come. Growing weaker and weaker, he did not clearly know what he was doing. Suddenly he started up, 
for a voice hailed him from above his head. He saw above him the high stern of a small vessel, and with the aid of a sailor he was helped on board. He found himself on the deck of a sloop of about seventy tons, John Nisbet, master, with a crew of seven men. They had sailed from Killebegs, County Donegal, in Ireland, for the coast of France, laden with butter, tallow, and hides, and were now returning from France with French wines, and were befogged as Kerwan had been. The boy was at once taken on board and raided as a seaman, and the later adventures of the trip are here given as he reported them on his return with the ship some months later. The mist continued thicker and thicker for a time, and when it suddenly furled itself away, they found themselves on an unknown coast, with the wind driving them shoreward. There were men on board who were familiar with the whole coast of Ireland and Scotland, but they remembered nothing like this. Finding less than three fathoms of water, they came to anchor and sent four men ashore to find where they were. These being James Ross, the carpenter, and two sailors, with the boy Kerwan. They took swords and pistols. Landing at the edge of a little wood, they walked for a mile within a pleasant valley where cattle, horses, and sheep were feeding, and then came in sight of a castle, small but strong, where they went to the door and knocked. No one answered, and they walked on, up a green hill, where there were multitudes of black rabbits. But when they had reached the top and looked around, they could see no inhabitants, nor any house, on which they returned to the sloop and told their tale. After this, the whole ship's company went ashore, except one left in charge, and they wandered about for hours, yet saw nothing more. As night came on, they made a fire at the base of a fallen oak near the shore, and lay around it, talking and smoking the lately discovered weed tobacco when suddenly they heard loud noises from the direction of the castle, and then all over the island, which frightened them so that they went on board the sloop and stayed all night. The next morning they saw a dignified elderly gentleman with ten unarmed followers coming down towards the shore. Hailing the sloop, the older gentleman, speaking Gaelic, asked who and whence they were, and being told, invited them ashore as his guests. They went on shore well armed, and he embraced them one by one, telling them that they were the happiest sight that island had seen for hundreds of years, that it was called High Brasail, or O Brazil, that his ancestors had been princes of it, but for many years it had been taken possession of by enchanters, who kept it almost always invisible, so that no ship came there and that for the same reason he and his friends were rendered unable to answer the sailors, even when they knocked at the door, and that the enchantment must remain until a fire was kindled on the island by good Christians. This had been done the night before, and the terrible noises which they had heard were from the powers of darkness, which had now left the island forever. And indeed, when the sailors were led to the castle, they saw that the chief tower had just been demolished by the powers of darkness as they retreated. But there were sitting within the halls men and women of dignified appearance who thanked them for the good service they had done. Then they were taken over the island, which proved to be some sixty miles long and thirty wide, abounding with horses, cattle, sheep, deer, rabbits, and birds, but without any swine. It had also rich mines of silver and gold, but few people, although there were ruins of old towns and cities. The sailors, after being richly rewarded, were sent on board their vessel and furnished with sailing directions to their port. On reaching home, they showed to the minister of their town the pieces of gold and silver that were given them at the island. These being of an ancient stamp, somewhat rusty yet of pure gold, and there was at once an eager desire on the part of certain of the townsmen to go with them. Within a week an expedition was fitted out, containing several godly ministers, 
who wished to visit and discover the inhabitants of the island. But through some mishap of the seas, this expedition was never heard of again. Partly for this reason, and partly because none of Captain Nesbitt's crew wished to return to the island, there came to be in time a feeling of distrust about all this rediscovery of High Brasail or Old Brasil. There were not wanting those who held that the ancient gold pieces might have been gained by piracy, such as was beginning to be known upon the Spanish main. And as for the boy Kirwan, some of his playmates did not hesitate to express the opinion that he had always been, as they phrased it, the greatest liar that ever spoke. What is certain is that the island of Brazil, or High Brasail, had appeared on maps ever since 1367 as being near the coast of Ireland, that many voyages were made from Bristol to find it a hundred years later, that it was mentioned about 1636 as often seen from the shore, and that it appeared as Brazil rock on the London Admiralty charts until after 1850. If many people tried to find it and failed, why should not Kerwan have tried and succeeded? And as to his stretching his story a little by throwing in a few enchanters and magic castles, there was not a voyager of his period who was not tempted to do the same. End of chapter 13